Hi guys, it's Miss Ash here, and I'm going to work you through our first part of notes on relative dating. So wh while you're doing this, you need to make sure that you're completing handout G2 that we've given you over geologic time. It's your first set of notes. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to understand and describe relative dating and apply the laws used to determine the relative age of rocks and outcrops of diagrams. And really probably the first thing we need to know is what an outcrop is. And an outcrop is really just any time there's exposed rock at the surface. So picture that you're driving south on Highway 65 and you're going towards Branson and you see all of those big rock cutouts. Those are outcrops. They're just rocks that's exposed at the surface. Those outcrops have been man-made because we've cut through our hills to build a highway, but you can also see them like if you're floating along the Finley River and you can see the bluffs that are there if you've ever been on the Buffalo and you can see those big bluffs. Those are all outcrops. So they can either be man-made or natural, but anytime you have that, those layers of rocks that are exposed at the surface, that's really going to be what an outcrop is. So whenever we look at our outcrops, we do something that's called relative dating. And with relative dating, what we do is we put our rocks in order based on the events that happened. So whenever you do relative dating, you don't necessarily know this rock is 5 million years old and this rock is only 3 million years old. Instead, what you know have to know is that this rock had to be laid down before that rock or this event had to happen after these rocks came in. And so whenever we do relative dating, it's really just a comparison dating of our rocks. So whenever geologists look at outcrops like this one down here at the bottom, they're going to start to look and say, hey, I wonder what happened with this. And we know that B or C can't be the youngest layers because they're at the top and there's things underneath them. So we had to have stuff come in before that. And that's really what relative dating is. We do this all the time. When you look, if you were in my classroom today and my four-year-old daughter was in here and Betty White happened to be in here with me, which would be super cool. If that happened, then you could look and you could be like, oh, I know that Mrs. Ash has to be probably the middle of the age of these three people. You know that I'm older than you just by looking at me and knowing the fact that you're in eighth grade and I'm a teacher. You know, you might not know exactly how old I am, but you're able to compare that and know where I am with things. Some of you, I went to school with your moms or dads, so you can kind of compare and know, oh, Mrs. Ash has to be about this old because she went to school with my mom and dad or because my older brother had her. I know she has to have been teaching for at least 10 years. That's all relative dating. Anytime we compare that, and this slide, and I'm just going to kind of let you read through it when I'm done, gives an example that we can do to kind of to arrange movies using that same concept. So with relative dating, the first law that we really use is a law of superposition. And with the law of superposition, what that means is if I look at a layer of rocks, the oldest layers are always on the bottom. And then as you go up, the rocks get younger. I had the other day, whenever we were doing our pretest, one of my students said this perfectly. She said, if you're building a skyscraper, you have to start at the bottom of the skyscraper and then build your way up. So I know that the oldest layer has to be on the bottom because that's where we started building. And that was probably one of the coolest examples I've ever thought about that. Now, the law of superposition really only applies to layers of rocks that are laid down flat. It's the first law that you need to know though. And we're gonna go through throughout this unit, we're gonna go through several laws and several examples of how superposition can be disturbed. But that's what I want you to always think about. When in doubt, go to the bottom because the bottom's always gonna be the oldest and the stuff at the surface is always going to be the youngest. And this picture kind of goes back to that example that I talked about with Betty White. If we were to line us up by ages, you would have the oldest person in the room at the bottom and then everybody else lined up. So if you think about it, if I made everybody in this room stand up and get into a line based on their age, I would be the person that's at the tail end of the line because I'm the oldest person. So I'm the back of the line. And then the student in our class who hasn't turned 14 yet, the latest birthday, the person who doesn't have their birthday until right before your freshman year starts, they're going to be at the very beginning because they're the youngest and everybody else would be lined up in between. 
as we work through this, one of the things that we have to do is rock layer correlations. So we know relative aging, remember, is putting groups of rock together based on their based on properties that we can find in them, not their actual age. And whenever we do that, we often look at rock layer correlation. And there's really three ways that we do that. We can either look for rock similarities, examine key beds, or examine index fossils. So those are going to be the three ways that we really do this relative aging. And our first one is comparing using similarities. And if you look on this diagram on your notes, we have to look at the overall appearance. So we start to look and we start to kind of match up and find things that are the same. So in this picture, it's going to be like, here's limestone, here's limestone. So those had to, those two had to be connected. Now, if you look, layer B sits up a little bit higher than layer A, and we don't have this granite down here. So something would have had to have pushed those rock layers separate, but we can still match the thickness and the type of limestone that we have and kind of compare and say, oh, okay, these match up. It doesn't match up to this limestone at the top doesn't necessarily match to these limestones at the top, but we can at least start to look and look at those two layers. We could also compare the gray shales and the sandstones, and we're going to see similarities. But whenever you get over to layer A, you have the dolomite and the red sandstone and the limestone and outcrop A. When you look at outcrop B, it's just limestone, limestone, limestone. So we can't match those up anymore. Whenever we use correlation using similarities, this is really our least effective method. It really only works over small distances. And it may or may not be correct if we have similar, it may or may not be correct because similar rocks layers may form in similar environments millions of years apart. So it can be really hard to correlate. But like if you look at the Grand Canyon, you can use correlation of similarities on the Grand Canyon because you've got your riverbed cut in between and your outcrops or your bluffs on either side. Same thing if I were looking at two sections of maybe like the Finley River or two sections of the Buffalo River. So we're in a really small area. I can start to correlate my rock layers that way. I'm probably not going to correlate rock layers in Ozark, Missouri with rock layers in Los Angeles, California, though. A lot bigger area, so we're not going to get the same kinds of similarities. The next one is correlation using key beds. And key beds are distinctive layers of rock that form over widespread areas for a very brief area part of time. So imagine if we had a meteorite impact that hit that made a huge crater and then created all that dust that came with it. That's going to be over a great big area, but it's just going to be this little thin little layer. So we can start to match up those little thin layers over big areas. We can also start to use this if there was like a lava flow that came in that just showed up in this one area or a big volcanic eruption. Like if you think in terms of that super volcano that everybody always talks about that's happening in Yellowstone, if there were a super volcano eruption today, don't worry, there's not going to be, but if there was a super volcano eruption that happened today at Yellowstone, it's going to cover the entire United States. And you could, so geologists in a thousand or a million years could come in and look at that one layer and be like, oh, this had to be at the same time as this because this is all volcanic ash from that Yellowstone eruption. The last way we can do it is correlation by index fossils. And index fossils are fossils or organisms that lived over a very large area, but a very, very short period of time. So we can't look at all of the fossils to be index fossils. Like if you look at this diagram, you start to see, like you can see those little moth looking things and you can see those little shells or trilobites and they're both in a couple of layers. When we show some more diagrams, they're gonna, you're going to see some that appear in several layers. If it appears in several different layers, you can't necessarily compare it. But if it just compares in one layer for a really brief period of time, we can look at it that way. So let's go into that a little bit more. To be considered an index fossil, it has to meet three criteria. First of all, it must be easily recognizable. So we have to be able to look at it, see that it's unique, so not like just a random seashell. It's got to look unique from other seashells. So we've got to look at it and see that it's unique. The second thing that we have to do is it has to be geographically widespread. So this needs to be found over areas so you can use them to match separated by huge distances. And I'm about to end up, so we will start on this on the next one.